So I want to talk to you guys about some systems that we've built at Jane Street for improving some of the modeling that we do. But before I talk about the system, I feel like I have to say a little bit about how Jane Street works because my own focus for a bunch of years at, at Jane Street has been on the software side of things. And I think people who hear me talk often imagine that Jane Street is completely about kind of systematic trading systems. That the way people work is they come in the morning and they build these trading systems, they write programs, they look at statistical analyses, and they tweak parameters on the scale of weeks as they kind of resolve different experiments and think about what's the right way to run the system. And that's definitely an aspect of what we do, but the trading at Jane Street is much broader spectrum than that. We have some trading that's like that, and we have some trading that involves not fully automated systematic systems, but things that are more like robotic arms than like full-on robots. Systems that are really augmenting the actions and decisions that traders make and tightly integrate with their daily workflow. And if anything, that's more central to the kind of trading that we do. And we even have traders who literally like type a specific concrete order into a front end and decide which exchange to send and what the exact details of that are. This manual order entry is an important part of we trade. We even do trades where you pick up the phone and think about how scared you are to trade with a person on the other side and whether they know something that you don't, right? So there's this enormous range of different kinds of trading. And that involves a lot of human elements. And modeling is still important there, but these aren't the kind of models that you think of from a kind of traditional machine learning, statistically driven model perspective, where the models are relatively opaque. These are models that humans are interacting with in a deep way and need to be able to understand and make changes to. And the system I want to talk about is really about how to make that kind of system work well, work effectively, and what programming techniques you can bring to the table to do that. And this is a you know, Scala meetup, but the, the lessons here, I think, are not specific to Scala and really not specific to functional programming. I think you can, you can take a lot of these ideas and use them in almost any programming language. So let's talk a little bit more about what kind of models we have in mind. So I think the first aspect of the models, what I was just alluding to, is the models need to be transparent. They have to be understood by the humans who are using them and indeed are often designed by the humans who use them. So there are trading desks that think about what models they want to have and think about what parameters they want to get and how they want to derive those parameters. And they're going to set them up and they understand both how they were constructed and how they want to modify them when their understanding of the world changes. That's kind of fundamental to what we're doing here. They're also shared. You may have a whole trading desk that is working together with a collection of interrelated models where many people are looking at it, different people are looking at different aspects of it. A change that one person makes to a parameter affects what they see but also what other people see. So there's a lot of interconnections between the work that different people are doing. The models are typically simple when you think about them on their own. Each individual component of the model, like it can, it can include things as simple as applying a currency conversion or doing the sum product of a bunch of fair values to compute the fair value of, that corresponds to a basket of securities. So the, the, you don't tend to have a lot of subtlety and complexity in the individual models, but altogether, the system can be quite complicated. You are, the, the, the full scope of the models is large. Uh, they, it takes a lot of computing power to compute them and a lot of effort to even express what is in there, what the, what the models have. And finally, there's streaming models, which is to say these are models that are responding to live market data. You're getting streams of data in. A lot of it is coming in as just updates from, say, exchanges where securities are trading. Some of the streaming updates come from humans entering parameters. There's lots of different sources of the data. But you need this as a kind of live, a real-time system that responds to the world as things change. OK, so those are the kind of models. Let's think about what the requirements are for a system like this. If we want it to be really good, what do we need? So it has to be flexible. It has to be easy for people to add new things to the system. Right? If there's some new kind of thing that they want to trade, they need to be able to write that down. You want them to have enough power to express it in the way that seems natural to the user. Right? So you need just a lot of expressive power. Um, and, and I think that's a fundamental thing and I think that's easy 
to kind of screw up, you're trying to get other properties of the system right, it, one way of getting the system to work in other ways is to limit the expressiveness of the system. But here, the expressiveness, the expressiveness of the system we build is fundamental. You also want it to be debuggable. And this has to do with a fundamental aspect of trading. And I'm not sure debuggable is exactly the right term. I might also just say understandable. Because one of the most important things when you're trading is being able to figure out what of two different worlds you're in. So imagine you walk in the morning and you start trading and your models indicate that trades are setting up. The, the availabilities to trade in the marketplace look good by the way you think about what the, what the values of the things that are being traded are. And when you see that happen, well, you could be in one of two situations. One is the models are setting up because there's some natural reason for that to happen. Say there's some external event that's causing people to demand a lot of liquidity right at that moment. And that's pushing things out of line. And there, it's a natural opportunity for you to step in as a liquidity provider and be able to make money from being the other side of those trades. That's one world that you might be in. The other world you might be in is you're wrong. You have made a mistake. You have missed some detail of what's going on. You don't understand exactly what's going on with the taxes, or you've missed, understood the definition of some security that you're trading. And the reason that it suddenly looks like you're able to trade a lot, you're able to trade in size, is because you're angrily stuffing money into someone else's pocket. And to be able to distinguish between those two worlds, you need to be able to look at something that's unusual, like, hey, my model is setting up by a lot. That doesn't usually happen. And understand where it comes from. Be able to break it down and see what contributes to that number that you're seeing showing up. So understandability is fundamental. And it comes up in this case where we're trying to kind of distinguish between these worlds. Also, just when stuff goes wrong, you have all sorts of safety checks in a system like this that says, oh, that number doesn't make sense, so we're going to kind of error out that part of the model. And you need to be able to understand when something errors out, why it errored out, to be able to kind of look back into the kind of structure of the computation and understand the reasons behind the problems. And that's hard, right? And you need, because it's hard, when you think about debuggability as an ordinary software developer and you think, oh, when a bug happens, then, then yeah, I can go and understand it and it might take me a few minutes or it might take me hours or days to understand the details of what's gone wrong. And in a system like this, the answer kind of almost always has to be that you need to be able to get the answer you need to understand what happened on the order of seconds, right? Minutes is a long time when there are trading opportunities afoot. So the kind of understandability and debuggability of the models is absolutely fundamental to what we're doing. It has to be performant. It has to run fast enough. Now this is, whenever you talk about something needing to be, to have good performance, well, it means different things in different contexts. We write systems sometimes where by good performance we mean, oh yeah, we can take down a few million messages a second and we can you know, consume and emit a packet in a handful of microseconds. That's not the kind of speed we're talking about here. This is human scale performance. So if it takes 10 seconds to refresh the, refresh the computation, that's super painful. If it takes a second, uh, it's a little longer than I'd like. If it takes a tenth of a second, it's great. And if it takes a millionth of a second, I just don't care. Like, that's not an improvement. So performance matters, but we're really talking about performance on a human scale. And then the last thing that you need out of a system like this is scalability. And I don't mean scalability in the I can run very big models, although you need that too, but I'm kind of classifying that under performance. I mean scalability in the face of complexity. So as you need to specify larger models, because in the end, these aren't just models for one tradable thing. There's maybe thousands of different securities that you're trying to come up with information about. And so you end up having lots and lots of little models that tell you about different little parts of the world. And you need that to be understandable in the end. You need to be able to manage the complexity of that. If you decide, oh, we think we've modeled this whole class of securities incorrectly, we need to be able to change the model in lots of different places. You want it to be maintainable in the way that ordinary software systems that are well designed can be maintainable. And, and that's going to turn out to be a very important constraint on how we design the system. So, this is not a unique problem. It comes up all over the place. There are lots of financial firms that need these kind of shareable models. And there is an industry standard solution. It's called Excel. Right? That's, that is the basic approach that people take to solving this problem. And don't snigger too much at Excel. Excel is kind of an amazing thing. First of all, if you like functional programming, 
Well, spreadsheets are a nice functional programming language, right? The, the expressions inside the, each cell that you have there, well, that is really a functional program. And it's more than just a functional program. It's a graph-structured program, right? It gives you, the, the, when you think about what's really going on in a spreadsheet, each little cell has an expression that tells you how it's computed, and that co com computation depends on a bunch of other cells. And then what's in those cells can depend yet on other cells. And this forms a directed acyclic graph, which really represents the structure of the computation. The graph is, by the way, dynamic. You can use what are called indirects in Excel to change what a given cell depends on dynamically, depending on what data it sees. And you, you, know, you can pull streaming data into Excel in various ways. And you get, in some ways, a very nice system. And that system has a bunch of advantages. So let's kind of score how the system does on our requirements. So it's very flexible. You can encode all sorts of complicated things inside a spreadsheet. The formula language, like I have some quibbles about the formula language. There are things that you could make better about it. But it lets you do lots of things. It gives you basic forms of control flow. You can you know, have if statements and other control things that let you make decisions about where you're pulling data from. It lets you express lots of different things that you want to express. It, it kind of checks the box there. The debuggability story is also really good. If you think about the difference between writing a system in Excel and writing a system in a traditional programming language, you can think of them as kind of dual to each other. In an ordinary programming language, the logic is primary. You see the code, that's the thing you look at. And the behavior, the data, the way the data flows through your system, that's the thing that's harder to look at. When you think about a spreadsheet, it's reversed. The data is as plain as day. You see it right in front of you. And by, by seeing that data, it gives you a nice way of understanding what's going on in the computation. The code is harder to see. The code is you know, sprayed out all over the system. And there can be sometimes surprising irregularities in a badly constructed spreadsheet that are hard to think about. But this, front, this kind of front and center role of data, this kind of data first programming model, has a lot of advantages in terms of making it possible to understand what's going on. And just very simple things. You want to understand why a given cell has the value that it does. You can just pull up that cell and see what it depends on, see what the expression is, and just look at the inputs and understand how that was constructed. It gives you a very powerful way, simple but powerful way, of understanding the way in which things can go wrong. And, and also understanding just what, it, even if you don't know if something has gone wrong, understanding where that value came from. Performance is more of a mixed grade. Excel has had an enormous amount. I can't imagine how many hours of engineering have gone into Excel. But a lot of that engineering has gone to good effect. Excel is very efficient in terms of memory usage. And it scales reasonably well when you give it multiple cores to run on. But there are limits. And we have, in the systems that we've built, really pushed those limits. We have some spreadsheets that are so large and complicated that you literally have to wait 10 or more seconds for a computation cycle to go. And literally, like, inserting a row into the spreadsheet takes minutes, right? So you, like, in some sense, the way we've run some of these spreadsheets is we just keep on adding stuff to them, adding more models, adding more data. Because we, keep, we want to do that because that's the thing that controls how we can trade, right? Every new model that we can add, every new security we can add in there is another trade that we can do. And we keep on running the system with more and more data until it almost falls over, and then we like run it like that. And so performance, it, it, it is, in fact, a good system for doing this in some ways. And another thing that's important is, another thing that Excel is, it is an incremental computing model, which is to say, you have this big graph structure, and if only part of the inputs to the computation change, Excel is smart enough to only run the subset of the graph that actually needs to be refreshed. And so it's got like the right basic mechanisms to be efficient, but it's not quite as efficient as we'd want it to be. So there's a mixed grade there. And scalability is where the whole thing kind of falls over. This graph-oriented computing model is great in the small. In some sense, if you want to understand what's going on in a particular corner of the graph, it's all very lovely. And it's terrible in the large. If you have millions of nodes with tens of millions of edges, just understanding what the hell is in there is kind of a disaster, right? You can, it's, it's, 
It can be enormously irregular. Different things have, can be constructed in different ways. And there's no clear way to see, even see what the structure is. So that's the thing that really makes the kind of simple, I'm just going to use Excel in a straightforward way, that model really not work when you want to do this at scale. So we understood that this was an issue. And we had some software engineers who we wanted to kind of stand in and help improve the system, both for performance reasons. Performance was one of the big motivations for improving the systems that we had, but also to improve the scalability of the system. And we're software developers. We know what we want to do when we see a problem like this. We go, we're going to write a program, right? Instead of using a spreadsheet, we'll write a traditional program in an ordinary programming language. Well, I guess if you count like OCaml and Scala as ordinary programming languages. And that was the thing that we tried to do. Our first attempt to fix the problem was to really go into rewriting the thing in OCaml. In some ways, I think of Jane Street as a company that makes money through the creative process of construction and destruction of spreadsheets, right? New ideas come into the world, some quick spreadsheet is thrown together that lets you understand and model what's going on, and then you replace it by like a real program that's actually maintainable when it turns out to be important. And we just kind of tried to follow that same pattern here. And it didn't work very well. So let me talk about why that didn't work so well. So let's kind of start from the parts that did work well. So the scalability story of code is good. Code is actually very good at expressing big and complicated things in a regular way. And that regularity is important. It kind of gives you a compression mechanism by you can write a small, compact program that lets you construct a very large and elaborate computation, right? the kind of parameterization you get from code is extremely powerful. And so that, and, and you get all of the ordinary advantage you get from the culture of programming. You get natural notions of, of uh, version control and release management, of code review, of testing. All of these things help you scale your programs. And things like type systems help you build programs that are kind of understandable even when they are at large scale. So the scalability part is really good. And performance is also good, right? We, you know, you need, the, the graph model that I described is fundamental. You need some incremental computing fabric in order to build a system like this just because the size of the models is large enough that you can't live in a world where you just recompute everything all the time. But you can do that. You can layer that into your otherwise ordinary code base. And we have all sorts of clever monadic APIs that let us, in a natural way, encode these kind of graph-like computation structures in what feels like an ordinary program. So far, so good. But now is where the story gets worse. The debugability or understandability part of the story was much worse. So it's not like we didn't think about it at all. We had hooks in the system where we could expose information for debug debugging purposes and places where people could dig in and customize different parts of it and explore what was going on in the computation. But it was only in the places where he explicitly decided that, that was we want, we want, what we wanted. And it just didn't work very well in the end. The understandability of the resulting system wasn't good enough. And the flexibility story was also kind of poor. So again, we could, exp we could express all the things that we wanted. So in some sense, that was good. It was sufficient to express the models that we wanted. But the moment to moment in the small flexibility of a trader being able to reach in and understand a small thing and modify it that was much better in the spreadsheet world, right? If there's some cell that wasn't doing what you wanted, you could modify the, the formula in that cell and get a change in behavior, understand what that change meant, understand how it fit into the rest of the system. And here, you, when you wanted to make changes, you almost inevitably had to go to this much longer loop of ordinary programming. It just takes more time and more consideration to write a program than it does to modify the formula in the middle of some large graph structured computation. So this story did not work quite as well as we'd hoped. So let's think about what's going on here. So the Excel model is in some sense very simple. You have a computation graph. That computation graph lets you build the results, the outputs, the computations that you want to see, the values that you need to, to be able to interact with. and then. There's the, pro the ordinary, pro I write an ordinary program and I can get those same results. And from a computational point of view, in some sense, the same thing happens on both sides. But there are different advantages to the two worlds, right? The, the computation graph version of the world 
gives you a nice way of interacting with and understanding in the small what's going on in your program. The ordinary programming approach gives you a good way of scaling to large and complicated models and to understand regularities of the system. So what we really want is the best of both worlds and it turns out there's a natural way of achieving this which is metaprogramming. Which is to say instead of writing a program that directly represents the computation that you, we want, we essentially write a program that explicitly constructs a graph that represents the graph structured computation that we're really going to expose to users. So the core model in some sense looks a lot like the model of Excel. If, if a trader who is interacting with the system can think about this very much as the same kind of thing that they might see in a spreadsheet. The end model we have has a formula language. It's not the same formula language as Excel. It actually looks more like a mini OCaml. It's a small statically typed language with a Hindley-Milner style type system. But that's not really the important part. The important part is it has the expressivity to kind of build the kind of computations that you need to do, much as the Excel formula language does. And instead of writing those by hand, we write them by hand, you have this complicated, hard to understand regular system, is hard to understand and uh, hard to understand an irregular system. You can do it where you generate with your well understood programs, you generate the, the, um, the graphs that you need to interact with. So it turns out this model works well and I kind of want to talk about why it matches the different requirements we have. So, the basic flexibility story comes out of the formula DSL. Having these explicit computation nodes, named nodes that you can point at, see in a user interface, and interact directly with, it gives the people who are, who are interacting with the system the flexibility to make changes they need to be able to make. And it's worth noting that it's not like people have the freedom to just modify any part of the graph that they want to. The way we construct the graph, there are some nodes that are, whose meaning is fixed, fully controlled, by the, by the graph generator part of the system, and some that are open that the people who interact with are free to make changes to, and those changes get saved and persisted over time. But the ability to do that is an enormous aid to giving people the kind of opportunity to make simple changes when they need to. And the, the debuggability is good because we have this graph model that gives us a semantically simple way of engaging with the system. It's performant some sense for reasons that don't have anything to do with the programming model. It's performed because we underneath it have a compute engine. We built our own parallel and incremental compute engine for running this thing on and you essentially need something like that. There's another talk you can give about the kind of algorithmic questions behind building that thing effectively but it's a kind of necessary piece for this kind of system. And then scalability comes out of using traditional programming techniques, the culture of code, all the things that we do when we try and build good, scalable, understandable systems. So this is a real system that we've used in production. We have multiple different trading desks who use this system for, to, to good effect, to kind of in, to express the models that need. On some desks, it's replaced big old spreadsheets. On other desks, it's replaced a whole bunch of systems, some programs, some spreadsheets, and kind of pulled them all together into one easier to understand system. We were able to meet the performance goals that we wanted to. It's about 10 times faster than previous iterations of the systems that we had. That's still slower than I'm comfortable with. I feel like th there's still work to be done to to really get the performance. I feel like there's another factor of 10 in there that we can get to if we really think hard about some of these algorithmic questions. Uh, and, but in some sense, the important part for us was really getting the functionality in place. And so we haven't had the time yet to really dig in on all the performance optimizations that we know are there. And in terms of the simplicity of the system that, uh, that is there, it's pretty good. So we have something like 50,000 lines of OCaml that generates three million nodes and something like 10 million edges in the system as it stands now. And just to get a sense of, of the regularity there, this was 50,000 lines of code maybe for the whole thing, but maybe 2,000 lines of code generates 2.5 million of those nodes. So most of the structure that's there comes from a very small amount of code. And this is super important. This gives you the regularity that you want. And that regularity is both important when you want to evolve your models, you want to make changes, you don't want to have to change everything in the world. And also in a day-to-day -day way, when a trader wants to understand what's going on, the complexity of the overall computation graph 
is limited because it doesn't vary in lots of arbitrary ways. It's generated by a relatively small code base. And another thing that's been nice about this is we've been able to build better analysis tools. When I'm talking about the graph model being more understandable, it's more understandable to humans, but it's also more understandable in a straightforward kind of computer science anal analysis sense. You can do static and dynamic analyses of the graph structure in a way that turns out to be very useful. So for example, if we kind of zoom back to talking about doing this in a spreadsheet, I said, well, when something errors out, you want to look at the things that fed in and figure out where that error came from. Well, it turns out you can make the debuggability story better by building simple analysis tools into the system. And those analysis tools can do things like, if a given, a given node is in an error state, walk back in the graph and find, to me, find me the oldest, the sort of the, the, the kind of farthest away nodes in the dependency structure that are in an error state and have no errors as inputs. Right? And that turns out to be a really good heuristic for figuring out what the true origin of a bug is. In, or true origin of an error is in a computation. And now that we have this simple computation model in our hands, well, we have the freedom to write these kind of analyses. And we don't really have the freedom to write these analyses on arbitrary code because you can't answer any questions reliab reliably about arbitrary code. Like, it's the, the, the old halting problem. Right? You cannot even answer the simplest question about a general purpose program, but something that's a simple graph gives you a lot more power. It gives the person who's writing the analysis essentially more power. So I'm really focusing mostly on the programming model here, but there's a lot of other interesting technical components of this. So there's some issue about the DSL design itself. This is a DSL that has its own semantics and its own type system. Uh, the DSL actually, it's, the DSL that goes inside the formulas is actually its own little incremental programming framework which allows you to optimize the execution of individual cells. They can take advantage of previous versions of the computation to optimize updates. So that is a further optimization the system supports. There's also uh, a parallel incremental evaluator that we had to build, which is an interesting set of algorithmic problems on its own. Uh, and a thing I really didn't talk about at all is there's the whole sharing question. There's a distributed configuration store which lets you synchronize the activity of a bunch of different traders who work on the same desk and maybe different traders who work in different offices. So this is really a distributed system. So we have people in New York and in London and in Hong Kong who are really collaborating and working together on the same set of models. And you both want easy and smooth sharing between them and you want it to continue to work when things are disconnected. It's kind of awful if you, know, you lose the Hong Kong-New York link or it goes flaky for a while and the end result is people in Hong Kong or New York or both can't trade anymore. Well, that's not good. So that's another interesting technical aspect of the system. And another piece is building a UI for this. So Excel, among other things, has a very useful and, and, and friendly user interface. You know, there are lots of things to complain about, but in the end, it's a, it's a really well-designed thing. And we needed to build our own UI, and we did this, in the end, as a web UI. And by the way, that's also an incremental computation story. We have a different incremental computing framework that we use. We compile OCaml down to JavaScript, and that runs in the browser. And there's a bunch of incremental computing tricks to make that be able to efficiently display the kind of fast changing streams of data that come from these models and give people like a good interactive experience that lets them explore data and see things when they go wrong. So there's lots of things we want to do in the future in this system. Um, one of the fun technical problems is the parallel and incremental evaluator. And I think this is actually, there's a bunch of, I think, just open questions about how to build these kind of algorithms. Well, we've talked to a bunch of people who've worked on this kind of change propagation problem. There's a lot of academic study on this. And I think there aren't clear answers as how to build these algorithms to get the maximum amount of parallelism that you can. And so that's an area that we're actively investigating. Another issue is scaling. We, as I said, we have something in our current deployment, something like three million nodes with 10 million edges. We really want to get to something where we could support 30 million or even 100 million nodes. And I think the system as it happens right now isn't quite able to do it. I think there's work we can do in terms of improving the memory utilization of the system. And I think also some of the issues with the parallel and incremental evaluation also needs to be improved to hit that, that kind of scale. So there's a lot, of, a lot of interesting work to be done there. Analysis is another important piece. Uh, we have a, a few simple graph level analyses that we do, but there's a lot more we can do. I think we could do a lot of useful stuff to help understand performance problems in the graphs. So you could get good tracing information out of the graph to help you understand uh, 
reasons why the computation you've constructed is slow. And another thing is when you have this kind of system, you have a lot of people hacking on it and generating new configurations and creating new models. You have a kind of dead code problem. There are parts of the model that no one has even looked at, maybe for months or years. And you want to be able to detect those so you can go ahead and delete them. Because the day where your model changes its mind and decides to look at that part of the graph that no one has looked at for six months, it's probably making a mistake. So uh, lots of opportunities for that. And then another interesting part of systems like this that I think, again, you might not have thought about but turns out to be important is support for what we sometimes call counterfactuals. And the idea is you have some, th this big shared model that everyone's using. And sometimes you don't want to just make a change. Sometimes you want to say, well, what if I did this? What if I made the following modification? And be able to kind of fork the world for a while and make a bunch of changes and see how they work out and see if you like them. And then if you like them, merge back in. And even more than that, sometimes you want the counterfactuals to be permanent parts of the model. You might say, well, I have this version of the system and I'm running it like that and say, well, what if I make this change? What does it look then? And then the difference between those two models itself might be an interesting thing, a kind of ad hoc derivative baked into the system. Uh, so there's both, there's both questions about user interfaces, how you make counterfactuals work well, but also algorithmic questions about how you efficiently build uh, counterfactuals into the system so that people can experiment with them in a lightweight way and it doesn't require you to do a lot of work either to construct the counterfactuals or to prepare the computation that you make for that. So, this is a very specific finance problem. These kind of, I, I don't think I've heard this kind of problem about these rich interactive models that people need to be able to debug very quickly. I don't think I've heard about that in, in any other context. But I think the lessons of this design are actually significantly more general than the particular application. So if we kind of zoom out and think about what happened here, we have two different solutions. There's a traditional programming. We just write code to express our models in the ordinary way. And it has some good points and bad points. The good part is the descriptions are concise and the models are regular. And the bad side is the semantics of the resulting system are complicated. Programs are hard to understand because they're so rich and expressive. It can be hard to analyze what's going on, hard for people, and hard for kind of technical formal methods to analyze. On the other hand, graph structured computations are verbose and potentially irregular, right? You just have a bunch of nodes that are connected to each other by default. Uh, but the semantics are simple. It's easy to understand for both humans and for analysis tools. And the metaprogramming trick gives us a way to get multiple different views on the same computation and give us kind of the best of both worlds. And this idea of giving yourself multiple ways multiple slices of the same thing is a general case. So I can just replace the word graphs with the word configs. And now there's the same story. In fact, we use very similar techniques for config management. Think about it. Configuration files are typically relatively flat and simple, easy to understand in the small. But if you look at the whole configuration of a big complicated system, the configurations can be gargantuan, almost impossible to understand in the large, highly irregular if they're done by hand. And again, metaprogramming is a way out of it. You have a, if you have programs that generate your configs, then you can look at both. You can look at the generating program to understand the big picture regularities and to make the resulting system manageable. And then you can look at the generated configs when you want to understand in the small the semantics of the system that you've constructed. And in fact, we see the same technique in other places too. We also, we, we've started getting, doing more work in terms of synthesizing hardware, doing FPGA designs in OCaml. And we take a very similar metaprogramming approach. And you get the same design. The program that generates the FPGA, that can be hard to analyze. But the FPGA is a simple, actually, again, graph structured computation. And you can throw SAT solvers and other formal techniques at it to understand aspects of it that are very hard to understand when you're analyzing a general purpose program. Another version of this idea comes up when you think about, um, another version of this comes up when you think about uh, testing. So we have a whole uh, set of tools for doing what we call expect testing, which is basically a way of capturing output from a program in the context of a test. So the details of exactly how it works doesn't matter, but the way we use it I think is interesting, which is a lot of the testing we do in this context doesn't look like traditional tests. It's not like you have a property in mind that you want to make sure is true. Some of what we do is just capture program traces. 
It's a way of getting kind of a slice of the semantics of the program that you've written. And by looking at those program traces, they give you another view on the program that you've written, another way of understanding what's going on. And that's useful both when you build some new feature by just taking an example and writing down the trace in some particular context gives you some intuition of to, as to whether or not it's behaving in the way you expect. And then as the program evolves, as you make patches that modify the code, you get two ways of seeing it. One way is you see the change that you made to the logic of the program, but you can also see the diff in the trace, right? The, tri the, kind of the, the change in this slice of the program semantics that you've gotten. So I think this idea of being able to construct multiple different views of the same underlying computational pro uh, process is a very general idea and one that it's worth thinking about where you can apply it in all sorts of applications. Okay, and that I think is all I've got. Thank you very much. Any questions? Thanks, Yaron. And whoever has questions, go ahead and raise your hand and I'll bring the mic to you just since we're recording tonight. We want to make sure to catch them. So why did you decide to use the uh, create a new DSL rather than just use OCaml? So Using OCaml has a number of downsides. Uh, so to be clear, we, the, the DSL in question is more or less a subset of OCaml, which is to say, when you write your metaprogram that generates the cells, you just kind of use a kind of quoting anti-quotation syntax and write things in OCaml syntax that are really expressions in the DSL. So actually, let me bring up a little example. So, so here you see on the screen two different computations, one written as an ordinary OCaml program and one written as a meta program that's generating, uh, this still on, that's generating uh, what's called web syntax. The system is called webs. And so you see that it's like, it looks almost exactly the same. There's just this little part where we write percent webs and instead of writing x times y, we write percent, f, percent webs x times y. And it uses the exact same OCaml syntax, but you're instead getting an AST of some other mini DSL that you have. So we try to share a lot with OCaml. In fact, the type system of the DSL embeds nicely in the type system of OCaml. So you get type errors when you're writing your OCaml program that tell you when you have type errors in the underlying DSL. So you get to share quite a lot. But we wanted to have this separate DSL so we had more control over what it was doing. Uh, and so that we can do it without having to like constantly dynamically link lots of little pieces. And so we have more control over the evaluation semantics, right? Again, it's, it looks like ordinary OCaml, but there's a kind of implicit built-in incrementality and dependency tracking in this language, which you wouldn't get if you were using simple OCaml for the DSL. It also, by the way, gives us the freedom to do things in the future, like if we want to emit LLVM, say, for like compiling down the computation to a specialized computation that like kind of both does the computation and emits the dependencies. That's the thing that's natural to do if you have your mitts on the AST directly. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, have you looked into blockchain assets trading and uh, can you say something about visualizing uh, this data maybe in 3D? Um, I would be happy to chat about blockchain after, but I think it's not super relevant to anything in the talk, so let's take that offline. Thank you to, for uh, the presentation. Can you mention some, like the structure of the DSL? How close was the team designing the DSL to the people using them? Because I can see that depending on what abstraction you want. So can you say that a little louder? I can't quite yeah. hear. How close was the team designing the DSL to the people actually using it? I mean, the people who were building the system were developers who were directly living on the trading desk that were that needed these systems, and people who, in fact, kind of were very tightly integrated in there. So there's a, I think that we, we had really earlier versions of systems that were, this was an evolution from. And so we really needed to think hard about the daily workflows and making sure that the people, the people on the software side really understood in depth what was going on inside the system. So the integration was very tight. Is that, we have a question up here also. Wait, let's start back here. Sure. Hi, uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, 
I, I really liked the ending there where you showed traditional code versus graphs and config files, etc. I was wondering um, where you think GraphQL might kind of fit into that model. I embarrassingly know essentially nothing about GraphQL, so sorry. <laughs> no worries. Thanks for the great talk. Uh, just a quick program language question. I see you have a pipe forward operator. Is it inspiration from Afshar? Sorry, say that again. Oh. The pipe forward operator is um, inspired by Afshar? So, we, so we had the operator, I think, before F -sharp had it. But we we use, it used to be pipe bang, and then we switched it to pipe greater than to line up with F sharp. Ah, interesting. So uh, it's not incredibly complicated. So you, the 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 back end, the key value store that keeps all of the configuration is just a Postgres database, so you have to be able to install that. And in fact, we have multiple, when you in distributed operations, you have multiple ones of them that are kind of replicating information into each other, so there's some complexity around that. Uh, and um, you need a set of servers that can run the system, and they're just kind of ordinary boxes on which you run the programs, and that's kind of that. The, the, the UI is just a web-based UI, so you just need you know, a web server to go get the JavaScript from. And you know, the, the, the client essentially is running in the browser. One of the nice things we have is we can run completely arbitrary OCaml code in the browser, and that means our internal like, binary, binary protocol RPC libraries and all of that just work. Like, you know, it goes over WebSockets instead of ordinary TCP IP, but you get a lot of the conveniences of having kind of one system and writing in what feels like a single language, uh, but you know sometimes it's executing as JavaScript and sometimes it's executing as native OCaml code. I think, uh, I, think I noticed uh, like this idea is uh, so general as you said. I think uh, it also found application in the build systems. Is it like is it like Bazel, for example? where you have a, a graph of dependencies explicitly uh, described in build files, and the build system has to figure out okay, what changed and what, what has to be recompiled, what recompiled uh, to, to do the increment efficient. Am I right to understand this uh, symmetry? Yeah, I guess in some sense there are two aspects of how we solve the problem that are both, I think, general things that show up in other cases. One is this multiple view thing where you use metaprogramming and sometimes other techniques to give you multiple different views on the same kind of computation. And then there's this other issue of like, oh, I have an incremental system that works by representing the computation as a graph. And yeah, that shows up all over the place. It shows up in build systems, it shows up in systems like this. The computational systems, like the self-adjusting computation systems that I described, like incremental, work this way. And actually, one of the things I found to be frustrating over the years is that these systems are all very closely connected, but it's hard to find a kind of core calculus, a set of shared abstractions that can be used to build all of them. You end up building a bunch of systems that are similar to each other and share lots of conceptual components, but don't really share any code. And that's kind of true here. We've built multiple different graph structured incremental computing systems. We have, heaven save us, two build systems that we've built. Um, and we have a bunch of different incremental computing systems with different applications that are optimizing for different things. And we've yet to find like the nice general purpose fabric that lets you kind of keep them all in one shared framework. Sounds like there should be one of them. Should be what? Monad. Um, monad. Oh, a monad. Oh, that, no, that doesn't help. That is, that is completely irrelevant, which is to say, yeah, some of these are monads. Yeah, we use monads, but that's like nothing. That's a very small part of the design. There's, there are, monads are a nice shared abstraction, but they're not like a, that, they're like, they're good, they're pleasant to use, but they don't solve any of the fundamental problems, right? There's all of this complicated graph structure and updating the graph and propagation and all of that, and the monad is just like a skin that you use for expressing the computation. It doesn't really help you at the kind of sh figuring out what the real core calculus that you need to share is. Anyway, I, nothing against monads, like them a lot, but it's not, it's not the issue here. Uh, just a 
dollars. Uh, can you show a demo of the web UI? Uh, I unfortunately can't. Okay. Sorry. Like I can imagine how the searches look like and how the code I mean, it's worth saying it is the most boring web UI in the world. It's like a bunch of tables and you can click on things and expand and see the details. Like nothing, you know, we're, we're still getting used to this whole web thing. Like there's no. So. So, so my question is, how uh, how has your adoption of DSLs affected, uh, like, improved or worsened your ability to reason about the code base and the code level? So, let's say, let's say you have a an idea that there's some flaw in the software. Are, are you are you able to reason about the code fundamentally differently, maybe through DSL because you use DSLs or Camel, you know, versus like the the, the, the original chain street languages? So it, it's interesting, like. I, one thing I'll say is that in some sense, we use domain-specific languages surprisingly rarely for an organization that's populated with a disturbing number of PL geeks. Uh, we've actually, on the whole, found that we almost are never happy when we design our own completely freestanding free domain-specific language. We've almost always regretted the decision to build those because every time you build your own language, it invariably sucks, right? Like, you didn't design the semantics quite right, and you didn't build any decent tools, and the error reporting is kind of terrible. So the vast majority of the time when we want what feels like a DSL, it's effectively some kind of embedded DSL, rather than, be, and, and the embedded DSL is often greatly restricted, right? It doesn't mean that you have full-on closures from, from the ordinary source host language baked in there. And there's a kind of fundamental design question you have to answer when you build a library like this, because an embedded DSL is effectively a kind of library, there's this trade-off of power. How much power do you give to the user of the library, and how much power do you give to the implementer of the library? And the more restrictive this mini language is, the more power and analyzability goes to the author of the library, and the other way you give the people who write it more freedom to build rich and complicated things. So I think in this case, the, the use of this very restricted DSL, which in some sense feels like it is, it's also represented as an embedded DSL in OCaml, but it's also a freestanding AST that we can evaluate on its own. Uh, that the fact that that is constrained and we can analyze it well enough to understand the dependency structure that is implied by the computation, that turns out to be really valuable. Um, but I feel like contrary to what you might expect, Jane Street is not a place awash with you know, lots of little baby programming languages all over the place. We actually think that's kind of a terrifying thing to do when we mostly try and avoid it. Should we do, we have time for probably one or two more questions if people have them. Yeah, thanks for the talk, uh, really interesting. Um, I was curious if you had any more examples of like the DSL or maybe some of the analyses results um, just to show. So I have a couple of other DSL examples I can pull up. Uh, there, I'll, 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 so I guess this one you can go into a little bit more detail if you just kind of look at what's going on. You're building, I feel like what I really want is a little picture, like you're building a simple kind of, you know, join, 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 join. So this is like a very unbalanced little tree. Uh, that you're building is probably not what you really, the kind of computation you really want to build in practice. You typically want more balanced binary trees when you're constructing things, and so we have lots of primitives to make that nicer. Um, let me pull up another somewhat more complicated one. So again, the, the thing on the top is the computation done in ordinary OCaml, and the thing on the bottom is done using webs. So here this kind of shows how the, how the kind of conditionals work. Uh, so here the, you get arguments. So the, in the first computation, the arguments are all simple floating point values in that first function, and the return value is a floating point value. In the second one, the inputs are web syntax values. And there's a type parameter there. There's actually a kind of interesting mix between dynamic and static programming here in that it is a kind of ordinary little baby Hindley-Milner type system for the DSL. 
but the, the standard values that are passed around look more like Excel values, meaning it's like a kind of dynamic, pro, uh, dynamic language style variant of like, it might be a float, or it might be a string, or it might be an int. And that just kind of fit, we're going back to the question of how integrated was this with the, with the desks that needed it, that was the kind of computation that people were used to, and they wanted that flexibility, so that's kind of baked into the language. Um, and then here you just see that the, that percent webs, like in there you have this more complicated, you know, if this, then that, else the other. Uh, and I mentioned before something about dependencies. One thing that's worth noting is you can, uh, in different branches, end up depending on different inputs. So in the first two cases, when you return error values, uh, you're depend well, I guess in all of these, you're depending on x and from and threshold. But if we had, say, another variable in there, hold on. So if you imagine that was like, let's say here. If that was x plus z, say, where z now doesn't show up in the conditions, then the node that's represented here would change its dependencies depending on the result of the conditionals. Right? So that dependency tracking turns out to be a fundamental thing that we're getting out of the expression language. A thing that's, by the way, missing from this example is it doesn't show you how you name things. This is just the kind of simple metaprogramming question of constructing a single expression. But really, each individual expression is put in a kind of cell that has a name, and then different computations will refer to values coming from different cells. So, yeah. And this is, well, this one's maybe too big to look at. <laughs> uh, but you can, but there's, you can see there's a little bit more structure here. And there's, in fact, there's, it's a little hard to see given the size, but there's, there's a kind of module notion where whole sets of cells actually belong to what are called modules. And when you refresh a computation, what you do is essentially blow away everything within a module and rerun that module and kind of lay it back out. It's almost like in Excel, blowing away a sheet of the spreadsheet and repopulating it. Uh, and this is how you avoid building up random cruft over time. You just don't let like random cells you constructed before continue to exist. You have some notion of scoping for the names and you can explicitly get rid of them when you want to rerun the kind of meta program that populates a sheet. So I could go over this with more details, probably not. It's probably easier to do huddled over a computer than in front of the whole room. So. Thanks. Is that to say that, you, that, that, that like the main interface oh. is, um, sorry, not, not to interrupt you. Um, what, uh, what do you guys use to compile JavaScript uh, for the front end? Do you use PuckleScript? PuckleScript uh, we use, so, right, so just to explain what all the pieces are. BuckleScript and JS of OCaml are two different OCaml to JavaScript compilers, and they have very different goals. BuckleScript is really focused on existing nicely within an existing JavaScript like development workflow, and in particular has the unusual goal for a compiler of generating readable JavaScript-esque output. Right? It tries to make the output pretty so that like, your JavaScript friends don't get really angry at you when you commit it to the repo. Um, and uh, there are some trade-offs there where BuckleScript doesn't quite as fully get exactly right all the semantics of OCaml, but it hits this goal of generating nice JavaScript very effectively. JS of OCaml, on the other hand, uh, uses the whole ordinary OCaml toolchain. It's actually, OCaml has a bytecode compiler, and it's actually a layer that takes OCaml bytecode and converts it into JavaScript. And it has shockingly good precision. We have big, complicated uh, libraries like our incremental computing library, like our asynchronous programming library, that play all sorts of dirty memory representation tricks that you take them and you compile via JS OCaml and it just works. It's astonishing. It's like, like, it's, it's like a yeah, it's a little bit, but mscript and the, the difference is mscript and targets like typically things like WebAssembly or the kind of the sort of very simple kind of numerical core of there and doesn't 
it's like that's a way of like getting a C program to run in a JavaScript world, but in a way that's quite separate from the rest of it. Where JS OCaml lets you easily call back and forth between Java and OCaml in a in a fairly lightweight way. So it gives you better integration than Emscripten does, but still preserves the semantics of OCaml shockingly well. So it's a, it's actually a very impressive piece of engineering, um, and it's also much easier to keep up to date with OCaml because it only has to understand the bytecode representation that doesn't change very often. So BuckleScript is great, but it's like a few versions of OCaml back. It's back at 402, we're now at 405. In fact, 406 is just about to come out. Um, whereas JS of OCaml is kind of always up to date with the tip. So there's various trade-offs there. Reason is a little complicated in that lots of people use Reason and BuckleScript together, but they're like totally orthogonal. Reason is an alternative syntax for OCaml and some tooling around that, which is meant to make it kind of easier and smoother for people who are outside of the traditional OCaml world. And it has, like, the syntax is in some ways just objectively cleaner and better. I love OCaml, but I, don't, I can't especially advocate for its syntax. Uh, there's lots of weird idiosyncrasies in it, and Reason fixes a lot of those. And it also just makes it feel more normal for someone who comes from a JavaScript background, like it has all the curly braces you could hope for. Um, but really, you could totally, you could use Reason with JSO Camel, you could Reason with BuckleScript. One of the nice things about Reason is it's extremely interoperable. It's not really in any way a new language, it's really a different syntax and kind of a different user experience, but it just generates, it just like desugars into a camel, and so everything is fully interoperable between the two worlds. So for this particular tool that you've been talking about, so do you basically end up implementing a, like, a spreadsheet kind of on crack? Like, is it basically the interface it still ends up for the traders being sort of like a spreadsheet-esque experience, but, but achieving the performance levels that they really need? So, the, the UI, so one thing that it in some sense loses from the Excel world is Excel gives you this kind of sheet-oriented playground where you can kind of do whatever you want and there's, because you have one uniform way of embedding the cells in, there's a uniform UI for all of that. And that's not really how it works in the, in the, the, in the web system. The system is called webs. And in Excel, you can like either, you could imagine creating computations by writing VBA programs that laid out sheets for you, or you could just do it by hand. And in webs, you really don't have the by hand option anymore. You really always generate your computations by way of metaprogramming. And sometimes you might explicitly choose to create little you know, grid-like playgrounds to do things. Uh, but that's not the norm. It's not like you have these big sheets everywhere. So the UI is not really the UI of Excel. It's its own UI. It's, you know, you, when you construct a computation, you write some OCaml code to say how you want that presented. It's not just like automatically presented by just like laying out whatever the grid happened to be. Um, Sorry, say that again? The, the input is not necessarily sort of like spreadsheet style, but the output. And I guess the, the computation model is like this. It has the same graph-like computation model, but the UI is not the same. Great. So I'm thinking maybe if people have more questions, will you will you be hanging around for a little bit? I am happy to stick around and ask questions. Okay. Yeah, we have more food, wine, beer in the back, so please hang out, stick around. Um, thank you so much, Alexi, for organizing this and all the by the bay, and thank you very much. You're really thank you. chock full of good information talk. So thank you. Thank you.